guys, but I really like to fuzz. I like to find vulnerabilities and post them up and, and you know, make a little money on the side with the bug counties and get some CVs. So uh, before we go on, props to AnyCon for two years. This is great. I spoke here last year. This is like a wonderful conference. Uh, I, I, I hope AnyCon keeps going. It's a really good group. Uh, it's in an area that doesn't have so many cons going on all the time, so it's, it's also great for, for that community. Uh, this is me. I'm John Dunlap. Um, I have stuff like this. Uh, this is this year's uh, Mac OS Privesk. I found a uh, privilege escalation in the cop statement. Turns out Ooh. that it lets you set. <laughs> yeah. It lets you set. Are we still on the mic? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, it lets you set environmental variables, which is bad. <laughs> I also have like this. Uh, I do a lot of reverse engineering kind of stuff. That's Ninja, if you've never seen it. It's kind of like Ida Pro. I also have like this. Uh, that, that's bacteria. Uh, um, I, I do genetic editing and like high uh, encrypted data in living organisms. Um, so this is me, if you want to get in touch with me. Uh, you know, add John to the lab too, that's my GitHub. Uh, you can check out the, uh, I have an automated tool for developing the encrypted organisms if you want to try that out at home. If you happen to have like a CRISPR setup or some, some uh, other similar plasmid editing software, hardware, you can do it yourself. Um, I talk a lot. Uh, here's some of my previous talks, you know, uh, DNA encryption, machine learning, FPGAs. Uh, uh, even hacker history, we did hope. I hope somebody saw that this year. Uh, 3D printer security. And last year at uh, AnyCon, we talked about jump oriented programming exploits. Um, I had a great time. I, I don't know if you noticed there, I spoke at DEF CON three times this year on one day. That is a lot. And this was happening. Uh, there was a sandstorm. I think I still taste the sand. Uh, so let, let's go on with it and talk about. Uh, our, our actual topic here, this fuzzing <laughs> cluster. Um, this, this is for anyone who's sort of interested in building a bigger than natural, bigger than casual fuzzing setup, but you're not quite Microsoft. You know, if, if someone here is from Microsoft or Facebook or, or some other large company, a Koichi group or something, if you're sitting in the audience, this is not going to be as good as what you do. This is going to be sort of a more brittle, more high performance thing that's meant for people who have uh, more time than money, but want to save some time and save some money. Um, so, uh, the sort of motivation for this was that. Um, Last year, I was doing a talk on 3D printing security, and I wanted to fuzz a specific uh, type of program called a slicer. Uh, we'll talk about that in a sec. But I was not able to actually fuzz slicers with the available fuzzing tools. Uh, if you're not familiar with fuzzers at all, you're generating like sort of randomized test cases for a uh, piece of software, hoping to crash it, hoping to uncover a crash condition that will lead to an exploit. Now, I really wanted to fuzz this uh, slicing software, but it turns out the slicing software itself was not performant enough to do fuzz cases. Uh, you could generate even relatively small 3D printable files, like very minimal test cases, and it would cause the fuzzer to sit around waiting, computing for perhaps hours. And that uh, <laughs> didn't work. Um, so what I wanted was a semi-automated high-performance system that I could use to uh, compute you know, big things to do a lot of fuzzing at once and just handle all the uh, workload of managing the jobs uh, and splitting it up. So that, that's what I wanted here. Uh, if you've never seen uh, slicing software, what it is, is sort of the compiler step of 3D printed uh, uh, software, like basically, uh, you take a 3D printed model and it analyzes it, it gives instructions for uh, what the 3D printer is going to do. It, it turns the 3D model into G code that moves the stepper motors. Um, it's very non performant on just about every slicer that exists, and uh, we want to get past that. So, we're going to talk about uh, porting some high performance compute optimizations into traditional fuzzers and smart fuzzers. Um, we'll talk about uh, standard techniques for speeding stuff up in general, and we're going to apply those to the fuzzers. Uh, we want more crashes. We want better crashes. We want uh, more of an ability to triage those crashes uh, at scale, like medium scale for us. All right? um, but we're going to have to make some trade-offs as to uh, how and if and why we're going to do that. Uh, like I said, we can't just throw infinite compute at this. 
Uh, that means that we might have to customize the target software in certain ways and make some smart decisions about where we could maybe give some of our engineering effort to get more out of the fuzzer uh, instead of just throwing node after node at it and um, you know, cleaning up the, the mess that results. Um, but I'm not the first person to think of this kind of thing. There's all kinds of scalable fuzzers. Like I said, Google has OSS fuzz, and you can check that out on GitHub. Uh, maybe in a future version of this stuff, I will run down exactly how that stacks up to what I'm doing, but it's pretty darn good. Uh, Facebook has, has a distributed fuzzer. There's a, the nightmare distributed fuzzer. Uh, there's various people trying to attack uh, OpenMPI onto AFL. Uh, these are all pretty darn good. Um, but we'll go over some of, like, say you want to do this yourself, or you want to make something really custom and sort of set up all the bits and pieces of it as you would for a scientific computing setup. You know, we're going on the model of, like, taking something that would normally be for, like, doing Monte Carlo calculations and porting it over to uh, doing fuzzing. So what are some of our high-performance compute optimization techniques? Um, and you keep in mind, we're, we're talking about like I'm an optimization script. I am a programmer. I do a lot of low-level stuff, but I don't, you know, I don't work for Sandy and Natural Labs. I don't do this all day. So we're going to have you know some elite techniques coming up. And we're going to warn you: uh, there's going to be a lot of talk about these two guys. It's not an ad. I'm not trying to like uh, advocate for one or the other, but uh, this is the sort of performance arms race that's going on in computers at the moment. Um, okay. So uh, here's the techniques we're going to go over in general. Okay, you know, SIMD optimization, I'm sure that a lot of you have heard that, you know, single instruction, multiple data, uh, threading, OpenMP, cache optimization, uh, same system multiprocessing, we're talking about stuff like OpenMPI, uh, GPU acceleration. Uh, we're not going to talk about open, uh, FPGA acceleration, unfortunately, too much. Uh, and then maybe like using an optimizing compiler. What we're not going to talk about is stuff like improving the big O, improving the algorithm, which can actually be a more profitable thing, but in a lot of cases with fuzzing, we don't have that choice. It's not necessarily a thing we could do, uh, and we'll talk about why that's not necessarily the most profitable idea all the time um, for our goals. All right? So moving on, uh, let's talk a bit about SIMP optimizations. If you're not familiar, uh, we're talking about same instruction, multiple data. It's basically assembly language instructions that let us operate on what you know used to be scalars like five times five, and work on vectors. You know, five fives times five, or something like that. Um, and Intel supports this on like the large computers up to five twelve bit. Um, you know, it looks kind of like this. You know, we can have eight floats or four doubles, uh, and that has the potential to speed things up a lot. And the way you do this, if you're altering some software to do it, is to add SIMD and uh, You could write assembly language by hand, but as we'll talk about in a second, as we examine each of the fuzzers and uh, fuzz cases and the use case scenarios, um, we don't want to alter too much of the program. Uh, if we're talking about the target program, and altering the fuzzer might not be worth it. So uh, we'll talk about that more later. <laughs> and of course, someone, as soon as you bring up like doing by hand optimization, someone in the audience is probably going, you can't do that, the compiler's better. And it's not always true. <clears throat> uh, one of the things you got to keep in mind is that the compiler is incapable of um, understanding every use case. Um, one of the things that compilers are classically bad at is understanding data dependence issues. And uh, even on like a very high end, like talking Intel's optimizing compiler, uh, you have to sometimes nudge it a little and go, actually, those, those are independent data. Uh, you can't optimize that. Um, so there's pragmas for that. Um, and if you don't know what I mean by data dependence, we'll show in just a second. But you know, you don't want any case where uh, your parallelized data is uh, depending on previous cases, like <clears throat> this situation. Uh, so we have Fibonacci sequence, and each iteration of it depends on the previous iteration. That means we can't unroll that loop into like eight SIMD operations all at once, because each iteration of it uh, depends on the previous one. So we can't do that. But if we're just doing like standard matrix multiplication, we can. So that's good. Uh, and that's going to impact our performance. Uh, most people are aware of threading, and most people are like afraid of threading. Um, and as we'll examine later, threading might not be the answer for uh, our fuzzer problems because limitations of the resources in the computer. Uh, but sometimes it can give you like big gains, like in normal scientific computing situation where you're working on a very small algorithm that's being widely parallelized. 
you can get like 10, 20 times speed ups. And you know, this is how you do it in OpenMP. You can just add this pragma that says parallelize this. And you know, uh, this blows the mind of people who have tried to do like GNU threads, uh, like P threads, and that, gone through the, the pain of that. Uh, with OpenMP, you can just be like, make it parallel. And that's a critical section. Actually, it just kind of works really well. And it's not as, as scary as uh, some people would think about it. Uh, then you've got cache optimization, which, again, we'll talk about sometimes fits what we want to do. Um, so this is going to be system dependent a lot of the time. Uh, it can be a really, really huge performance optimization, but it's not something that we can think about doing automatically. So we can't like programmatically mutate the target software to work inside of our uh, you know, L1 or L2 cache. Um, and that sucks. You know, most people are afraid to like get their hands dirty doing this, uh, but it is it is possible, but the trade-off for engineer time versus profit is like not so great, especially in our use case. We'll talk about that later. Um, there are also some special caching architectures you can get into. Uh, again, I'm not advertising here, but uh, Intel Phi has uh, Xeon Phi's have this thing called the MCD RAM, which is like a high-speed shared memory architecture that you can actually use their uh, optimizing compiler to say put this in MCD RAM. And in, if your entire program or entire subroutine fits in the MCD RAM, it runs lightning fast. It's a huge difference, and it is slightly automatable. So that could work if you have the optimizing compiler and you have the MCD RAM, and maybe you don't. Uh, maybe your VPS provider doesn't give that to you. Maybe uh, you can't get that off Amazon or DigitalOcean or whatever. Um, and then we're going to talk about um, MPI or a message passing interface, and just the idea of spreading this over multiple cores and multiple hosts. MPI gives us the tools to do this so that we can send messages between the various sub-processes and get stuff done. And this, this is probably the most applicable thing uh, for fuzzers, but they have already sort of do it to various degrees. Uh, here's you know, what open MPI looks like. Here's more. We'll get going through this quickly. Then, uh, we could just like throw all that stuff out the window and redo the entire algorithm on a GPU. And this is something that a lot of people are trying to do. There's a lot of um, ongoing research on it, but there is no like GPU dedicated fuzzer because translating uh, your algorithm into something that's going to run the GPU might change the semantics of things, and you might not get the same crashes. It's it's hard to find where to put the work on the GPU for this particular use case, but it does make stuff like really fast. So let's talk about our HPC stack that we're going to build. And people are familiar with HPC. If you've done this in like college setting, it's all going to be about the same, and it's all kind of open sourcey and easy to put together. <coughs> so the first thing we want is a job queue. Then we want some way to pre-process our fuzz jobs. Then we want to run our fuzzers. Then we're going to do a crash triage, and then we're going to sift through our output for the answers that we want to get. Now, uh, for the job queue, uh, we want some way that uh, we're going to be aware of how many system resources we have, how many nodes we have to use, how much room the nodes have. Um, and uh, basically, uh, what I went with was uh, open grid send it type thing called Torque, uh, which is available on Ubuntu. It's easy and it conforms to, if you've used like QSub and that kind of thing in college, it, it works just like that and allows you to submit a job to the queue, and it'll take care of the rest for you. Um, and then, uh, if you're running something like AFL, like a smart fuzzer, you might need to carefully design your fuzzer job preprocessing so that you're not losing performance there, or you're, uh, you might have to instrument binaries for this to work. So you might have to like recompile these each time you're about to set that set up. So that's a step to consider, but not one we can really optimize without changing the semantics of the fuzzing software. So we're not going to talk about that too much. Uh, but we are going to talk about uh, some fuzzers and how we would optimize them and where the sort of performance trade-offs work out for you know, the purposes of the experiments we're about to do. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little about crash hiding and tools like this. Uh, and then we're going to string it all together uh, and try to get a profitable result. So once again, we want the largest number of crashes, and we want the most high-quality crashes. So let's take a step back and sort of consider the options for applying the optimizations we just talked about to our uh, HPC fuzzing cluster setup. 
a good idea of like what we want the architecture of the thing to be. Um, but now we have to know like how can we make this faster because on its own it might not be worth our time. Okay. Uh, first of all, we'll consider like uh, optimizing the fuzzer. Uh, and one thing to keep in mind is that although we're talking about fuzzers in this talk, the fuzzer itself might be doing only a fraction of the work itself, right? The fuzzer might run way more performantly than we ever need it to. It's not what's holding us back. It could be context changes like forks that are holding us back, where you know we're invoking that child program, the target program, and it could be the target program itself that's holding us back. So we might think of like ways to automatically optimize the target program in such a way that we're not changing its semantics. Um, you know, in a typical AFL fuzzing situation, a lot of times the limiting factor is the call, the fork, and we're waiting for the context change from the operating system most of the time. So finding ways to, to reduce that um, could be good. But we'll consider, you know, how we can lower the cost of our fuzzing, even though we know that's probably not the, like, main source of waiting around, right? And uh, we could add SIMD, right? We could recompile AFL or uh, whatever fuzzing solution you want. You, uh, you, you use the fuzzers available for, uh, for claim, for instance. And uh, you know, make sure to put a full complement of SIMD. Uh, and that might be done automatically on your system, but a lot of times the like, default compilation setup is a little conservative. You might be set to compile with uh, AVX 256 instead of 512, so like manually uh, specifying that might get you a little more performance out of the compiler, but it's generally kind of not only barely worth it, right? But you might do better by like manually setting it. Uh, in my experiments, I got a bit maybe a two percent speed up, probably neg negligible out of uh, uh, sort of recompiling um, AFL with the maximal uh, AVX setup, so with a 512 bit. Uh, and you know one of the reasons that is is that it doesn't spend a lot of time doing things that are amenable uh, to SIMD operations. Uh, what about OpenMP? Well, again, because of the way fuzzers work, we're sort of expending all of the threads on the system, so we don't have a whole lot of threads to give. So that might not help us up as much as we uh, would hope it would. Uh, so that's we might toss that. And for FBI, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Like. If we can just throw this on a bunch of clusters, a bunch of nodes, uh, that might make things faster, but the return on investment isn't as good because we have to pay for all those nodes. And uh, again, nature of the fuzzer, because we're spending most of our time context transitioning to the child program, uh, optimizing the cache is probably not going to be a thing. So what about the target software? So you know, when I say the target software, I'm talking about uh, you know we're going to fuzz uh, libpng or something like that. Uh, what about optimizing that? Is there are ways that we can optimize the target software without hurting the semantics of it and missing out on crashes? It's probably possible, and it's probably where most of our workload is sitting, at least in the way I fuzz things. Um, now. With SIMI, uh, this is very dependent on the exact workload of the program, on what it's doing. If the program is doing stuff that is kind of vector math-ish, if it's doing a lot of matrix multiplication, like, I don't know, libpng, right? Uh, then, yeah, we, we can get a pretty good speed up. Um, dependent, right? Uh, and we could get an even better speed up uh, if we did this manually and use, like, again, Intel Optimizing Compiler gives you a way to manually specify uh, places where you want this to happen, the, the downshot is that, that that's a lot of manual work up front. And if, you're, if your personal cost of labor is more uh, than you're getting in terms of speed up, it might not be worth your time. Just making sure you have the optimal SIMD set up automatically from your compiler, using the optimizing compiler when you can, uh, you might uh, get your best return on investment. Uh, with the target software, OpenMP, basically trying to add more threads, again, it's really hard to get any gain out of this because the fuzzer is using up all the threads by running jobs in parallel. Um, so we might not be able to get an automatic speed up this way, but we can kind of think about maybe there are ways that we can be smart and uh, try and use the threading in a way that's more advantageous. Uh, this is kind of a thought experiment because uh, I, I'm still in the process of 
implementing some uh, instrumentation, some changes to the binaries added in the fuzzing stage that would automate this. But you know, what if we, what if we only threaded the parts of the program that are invariant, right? What if we uh, only split that up and then serialize the bits that are changing, the interesting bits, or the opposite? Uh, would those be worth a try? Uh, that's kind of an open question that I'm trying to answer over the next six months. Uh, what about multi-programming, uh, message passing interface? Yeah, I mean, lots of people are already doing this. This is a easily easiest thing. But again, we're doing this synchronously with uh, the fuzzer at this point. A interesting thought experiment is, is there a way to get more out of your open MTI by doing it asynchronously from the fuzzer, by setting up different sort of relationships between the child processor and the fuzzer? Can we do stuff in batch separate from the fuzzer while the fuzzer's waiting around? That is a more interesting question. Um, so, uh, with the triage software, we have sort of the same problem, but running double. Because when we're triaging crashes, although we have much fewer crashes than test cases, uh, we're going to usually be invoking a debugger. And that debugger is going to be invoking the uh, target software and running it until it crashes. And you can see we, we're like uh, really suffering not one, but two, but probably three context changes. And that's going to slow things down a lot. Um, but going over the existing optimizations, there really isn't much for it. Right? Other than trying to find a way to re redo the entire structure, the entire architecture of this setup so that we don't have to do those crashes or do those invocations of the debugger. So uh, what we learned in this section of the talk is a great majority of the work is done in the child process. And optimizations to the fuzzer itself don't make as much difference to the overall performance as optimizations to the child processes, generally. I'm sure there, there are special cases where you're running especially small programs, and uh, the fuzzer is able to outweigh uh, the child programs. But most of the time, we're either context switching and waiting because uh, we don't have enough threads, or we're waiting on the child program to finish and crash. Um, so what I did to do some testing on this was to construct sort of a fuzzer race, and uh, sort of a design an informal experiment to see like how these. Uh, optimization sped up, strictly speaking, the automated ones, and whether we could design like little automated fuzzing HP system that uh, would be profitable. Okay? So uh, here's our experimental design, informally. We're going to uh, set up um, our little uh, f uh, imaginative fuzzing cluster uh, setups and try and learn from the performance like this. Uh, first, we have a uh, VPS setup on DigitalOcean. Um, let's see, in fact, this, this slide is wrong. We actually did four nodes uh, and a control, so five total uh, images uh, running torque for uh, control queuing and uh, with these setups. And uh, you know, here's my DigitalOcean cluster, and uh, here's some of the performance of it running with like uh, computing digits of pi or something, you know, a few nanoseconds. And then we're going to take our target software, uh, in this case, Objunk and LibMagic, and sort of count the number of crashes we can make. Uh, we're going to time it to 10 minutes and uh, run it against the uh, control and see if we can get a, a bit of a speed up and see if ultimately all of this is worth our money. Um, and here are the sort of raw, very rounded results, uh, you know. And we see a little bit of improvement from SIMD could be worth it, uh, especially on uh, Objump, for some reason, gets a lot out of it. Um, when we do the multi-programming, it's a huge increase, but it's a whole huge increase in terms of cost. And OMD gets us almost nothing. I promise I'll give you a better graph in the future. Watch my Twitter. I just really, I really hate Mathematica, and like there, there are moments when I'm doing these talks where I'm like, oh my god, how, how did they go? Uh, so you might have some questions, I'm going to cut a few off at the pass here, and, and just kind of answer what, you, what might already be in your brain, you know, like what did we learn from this? Um, you know, again, as we already knew, distributing across multiple nodes works very well, but doing the automated SIMD gives us a nice little boost that might make things more worth your while. Um, 
how much did this cost me? Um, four nodes is like 300 bucks a month. Um, you know, and these are these are the high speed digital ocean nodes. They're not the, the basic ones. Uh, they each have like four CPUs that are supposed to be dedicated ish, and uh, it's, it's pretty fast. <laughs> um, if you're asking yourself what the break even, if you want to try this, uh, you just got to ask yourself, can you make 300 bucks a month disclosing vulnerabilities? And I think if you're into exploit development, you can probably do that, right? And um, really, at the speed that this is generating crashes, do a lot better than that if you, that's all you did full time. Um, uh, you might be asking, would this be cheaper with an at-home setup instead of a VPS? Because everyone's worried about, you know, the VPS is, is like a multi-home kind of thing. Uh, maybe the performance is not the best. Um, no, because you have to pay for power, you have to pay for cooling, you're going to destroy your stuff. You know, I can, I can run DigitalOcean's VPSs into the ground and not have to worry about my CPUs melting. Um, so. Keep that in mind. And you know, the parts that we didn't talk about in this talk uh, is like a slick system to integrate this, to visualize it, to deploy updates. Uh, that's not here. Uh, my continuing research in this direction is uh, I'm working on several methods to sort of automatically GPUize fuzzing setups where we take repetitive work in the test case and move it over to the GPU so we can get the status of the registers to where we need it to be ahead of schedule so we spend less time in the test case. Um, investigating ways to speed up fuzzing with machine learning. Um, there's a, I'm about to link you a paper where they use neural networks to get us, again, where we want to be faster. And uh, also, you know, if you notice, like one of the key breaking points here is all the calls to fork, all the exact calls in this, and finding a way to restructure everything so it sits in memory all at once, we're not constantly calling for it, is it's a good thing. Um, I don't have much to say about GPU accelerated fuzzing. It's still kind of nascent. Here's a paper on the neural net based fuzzing. If you're interested, you should check this guy out. He's at Microsoft. He does very cool work. Um, and that's, that's about it for the main part of the talk, but I'd be glad to take questions if you have them. Yes? Um. If you are dealing with a program that has, say, like a lot of bootstrapping or libraries that need to be pulled in to the mm -hmm. part where you want to start fuzzing, can you leverage copy on write to sort of like get that initialization uh, out of the way and then spawn child processes from that breakpoint? Hmm. Well, yeah, you could, uh, but the problem is doing that in an automated way, right? right. Where you're not going to change the semantics of the child program, and you know one big. One big piece of research that uh, has been going on, it's not new, but it's definitely not in um, the limelight of sort of automated software testing research, is the idea of slice testing. Finding a way to automatically slice up the program into component bits and testing them separately, because obviously that will be a great deal more performant, and we don't have to de deal with the problem of getting up to the place, right? But then you have to deal with the question of, is everything in the same state semantically that, that it would have been if we had worked our way up naturally. Hmm. So, uh, you know, it's different situations where, like, if, are you able to totally fuzz library calls independent of each other? Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Sure. What would typically be a target for this kind of fuzzing? Um, so the easiest thing to do with uh, automated coverage guide fuzzing is native programs that take a simple file, like uh, libpng is great, you know, you, you can do conversions of image files, right? But you can do it with protocols and stuff, it just takes a lot more bootstrapping to set up the communications ahead of time. Like a, a common paradigm uh, when people do like open SSL type fuzzing is they have to like reprogram the server and the client into one program so that you can just send it test cases and not have to deal with the like TCP communications. Sounds like a pain, doesn't it? Yeah, been there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions? Oh, oh, okay. Uh, so this is my contact. If you want to uh, get in touch with me, um, you can also. They're not up yet, but like tonight, the slides are going to go up here, and uh, the, the script I used to launch these will come up soon. I want to give a non-buggy one where I'm not disclosing a password or something. I'm a security engineer. I don't want to do something silly. And uh, I'm doing like part two of this talk at B-Size DC. So uh, thanks everybody.